Let's face it, the anatomy of the central nervous system is complex and difficult. And that includes the cranial nerves. And in this demonstration, I can't make it any simpler. But what I am going to do is I'm going to point out how a knowledge of the anatomy of the cranial nerves can be of great importance to the clinician in both the examination of the cranial nerves and in the interpretation of their involvement in diseases and injuries of the CNS and of the nerves themselves. So let's turn to the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. And if I show it to you here in the specimen, here's the ventral aspect of the brain, and there is the olfactory nerve running back into the base of the cerebrum, back into the inferior aspect of the brain there. So when we look at the inner aspect of the skull, we can see the anterior cranial fossa with the crista there, the crest, and on either side, the cribriform plate. And it's through this multiple perforation plate that the fibers of the olfactory nerve emerge from the nasal cavity to enter the olfactory nerve, which I showed you, running along like that, along the anterior cranial fossa of the skull. The olfactory nerve is interesting in that the Sensory nerve cells are actually in the epithelium of the nose, the nasal epithelium. And run back along the optic nerve to synapse within the olfactory nerve back into the brain. Compared with the usual arrangement, in other sensory cranial nerves in which the peripheral receptor runs back in the nerve to the ganglion and from there runs back along the tract to synapse. So that nerve cell in the remaining sensory elements of the other cranial nerves is actually situated here in the olfactory epithelium of the nasal cavity. The sense of smell in man is very poor compared with other animals. And in fact, the first nerve, the first cranial nerve, uh, only supplies about a square centimetre of the upper extremity of the nasal cavity on its lateral side and then over on the another square centimetre on the medial side over the nasal septum. Very small area. Compared with, let's say, the dog, which has got a very complex turbinate system inside the nasal cavity, where the receptors of the olfactory nerve actually cover the great majority of the extent of the nasal epithelium. In some fish, for example, the shark, the olfactory bulb is enormous at the, uh, at the apex of the shark's olfactory nerve. So blood poured into the sea can be detected by a shark a mile away by its sense of smell. Our sense of smell, the human sense of smell, is very poor. Now, when we talk about the sense of smell, we're actually talking about taste, because it's the olfactory nerve uh, that uh, detects taste. When we say something, ta a meal tastes nice, 
we mean it smells nice. If the olfactory nerve isn't working, we're tasting with our tongue, as we'll describe later on, the sensation of sweetness, salt, bitterness, that's all. When you've got a bad cold and your nose is blocked up, you can't taste your food. You can only tell whether it is sweet or salty or bitter vinegary. Now, the interesting thing is that the first nerve can easily be injured in a particular fracture, which I'll demonstrate on the skull. It's a fracture of the anterior cranial fossa here. And the common injury is a motorcyclist who has a frontal impaction injury there. Fracture will go across the anterior cranial fossa, across the frontal bone. And if I show you this specimen, here is, of course, a post-mortem specimen of an anterior cranial fossa fracture. Here's the fracture line going across the roof of the nasal cavity. When you see a patient who's recovered from this injury, he will often complain bitterly uh, of anosmia, inability to smell, i.e. inability to taste. And he will say, I put a lot of salt on my food, I put a lot of sugar in my cup of tea to get at least some sort of flavor into my food. Another accompaniment of such an injury is important. And that is that the dura over the anterior cranial fossa uh, is torn. And it is not at all uncommon for these patients to trickle cerebrospinal fluid uh, through the nose. CSF rhinorrhea, discharge of cerebrospinal fluid in the nasal secretion. Now, if you see a patient with a severe frontal injury. He's often got a nose bunged up with blood and mucus. So how can you be sure that this fluid trickling out of his nose isn't just mucus, but contains cerebrospinal fluid? You collect it in a little bottle, and you simply use a dipstick test to see if there's sugar in that fluid. If there's sugar in the fluid, it's cerebrospinal fluid because mucus has got very little sugar in it. So how do you test clinically uh, whether a patient has got anosmia, loss of smell, following a frontal injury? Well, I suppose if you're in West End private practice, you use a bottle of Chanel Number no. 5. But as a poor old jobbing professor of surgery with no private practice, on my examination tra tray, there was this little bottle containing rather cheap aftershave lotion that I used to use. And I'd say to the patient, can you, oh my God, can you smell that? Can you smell that? I won't advertise it. <laughs>